Great, thanks so much. So as you heard, uh, I'm gonna start with a couple sort of organizational disclaimers just to set the stage. First, uh, I'm gonna have to apologize that a lion's share of my talk is gonna sort of juggle between being distressing and depressing, right? <laughs> uh, and that's just the nature of this talk, uh, but never fear, the last vignette that I'll discuss ends on a high note, something that's positive, something that we can look forward to as silver lining. Uh, the second is that um, I really love giving these public lectures. It gets me out of my usual comfort zone of talking to PhDs. Um, and there's uh, multiple ways to, to, to change someone's talk to different audiences. What I have done is I've increased dramatically the amount of background overview material to sort of give you context and significance. What I haven't done is I've not dumbed down a single slide. Every slide you'll see today are the slides that I give my PhD students, that I give my faculty peers. I probably won't in the, in the really deep vignettes go into all the gory details of how the data was necessarily generated or what each data point means. But the reason I have all of that data up there is that's what science is all about, right? It's the distilling of information from data. Um, and what I've done is in every, every slide where I show data, at the very bottom is a reference to the paper where that data is described, how it was generated, who actually collected that data. And every one of those papers is available as a free PDF for download from our lab website. So feel free if there's something that uh, is not immediately obvious when I talk about it, to go and read about it uh, further, right? So, uh, and also I know that a lot of young people in the audience, uh, there's going to be some jargon in those slides that you don't understand and that's perfectly fine. I'm happy to discuss that afterwards or, or later. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep at least the discussion of those slides at a fairly high level to try to get to kind of what, what the data means as opposed to uh, focusing on the points themselves. So without further ado, uh, one of the things that I want to, oh, this is not advancing. There we go. Uh, emphasize that all science, or at least I'd say all good science is team science, right? Um, I'm here telling you not really what I do on a daily basis, but more what these wonderful people get to do. Um, uh, this is the reason I do science. I certainly care about the topic that I'm gonna tell you about and the various other topics that my lab works on. But the reason I go to lab every day is to interact with these wonderful people. Uh, and they come from a whole diversity of backgrounds. And so it's so one of the things I like to emphasize in talks of this type is any one of you, no matter where you come from or what age you are, can be a scientist. Um, and uh, the, the more different you are from the way you picture a typical scientist, the more you have to actually bring to the table. So let me emphasize that, that uh, the reason it's a fun uh, uh, exploration in science is because I get to do it all of these fun people. What I'll do on, on the few details that I go into, the few stories I'll tell, I'll, I'll highlight the, uh, the people who have actually led those studies, but obviously with the length of time that we have, uh, I'm only gonna be able to do with a few uh, folks there. But you know, we have um, uh, postdoctoral fellows, we have graduate students, we have technicians, we have undergraduates, and we even have high school students currently in the lab. Uh, and we've been also very fortunate to uh, graduate a number of folks recently who've gone on uh, to different parts of the country and of the world. Uh, so starting out really sort of at the 30,000 foot view, one of the most uh, important motivating factors for everything my lab does is recognizing that we live on a planet that is dominated by microbes. So what's a microbe or a microorganism? It's this amazing part of life on the planet that you can't see. And it's kind of strange that that's how we describe these particular organisms, the fact that we lump all of them together, the fact that they're not visible to the human naked eye. But they represent an incredible amount of the chemical diversity that goes on on the planet, right? We would not be here without the microbes. Life on, life on Earth evolved because of microbial activity. And what we're beginning to understand is that not only is essentially every surface, whether that surface is natural or man-made, dominated by microbial cells, but importantly, these microbes live in communities, right? Much like we think of forest ecosystems or uh, ocean ecosystems of the type of terrestrial animals or aquatic animals, much like that, animals live, or these, these microbial animals live together in diverse communities. And, I, and I, I really want to keep emphasizing this because this is not the way microbiology is usually taught. Uh, it's not the way that we usually uh, uh, think of microbes, and I'll, I'll emphasize that a few more things. But really, I would argue this is the way we uh, need to appreciate them. Yeah, go ahead. Are there microbes that are entirely in the clouds? 
there really are microbes in the clouds. Uh, no, some of them do cycle back down, but actually it's thought that many of the nuclei that form clouds are actually microbial in origin. Uh, so there's an air microbiome or cloud microbiome project. So. Uh, look up Noah Fierer, F-I-E-R-E-R. -E -R. He had a nice paper on the cloud microbiome. Um, so this is a nice cartoon schematic uh, that I like uh, uh, to, to sort of bring me towards this recognition that unlike the pictures I showed you before, which was these clean boxes of different habitats, these habitats are actually all v highly interconnected. Right? We might label them from a human perspective as being important for, for instance, producing uh, uh, food and animals uh, uh, for agriculture. We might think of ourselves as siloed as humans in our houses. Uh, we might think of a wastewater treatment plant as somewhere far away. But really, all of these habitats are connected. And importantly, what that means because they're connected is that they're highways that microbes can exchange across. Right? So this idea of transmission across habitats is something that also I want to emphasize uh, for the primary reason is if I uh, perturb this habitat in some way, if I push these microbes, if I do something to them, those changes to those microbes in that habitat can then transmit across other habitats. So put another way, if I was to damage something in a natural ecosystem, it might eventually come back and impact me even though I don't directly interact with those microbes, right? Because of these microbial transmission highways. Um, so if you were to Google search microbiology, right? Google image search microbiology, this is the kind of stuff that you would see. The nice, colorful, pretty images. Um, and I would argue, uh, and I'll show, try to show you and convince you, that this is a, a pretty uh, myopic and, and inaccurate view of microbiology. This is the microbiology of domestication. The microbiology of where you go into natural habitats, get those microbes out, put them in the lab, take them out of all of their diverse neighbors and look at them on their own, right? As you might imagine, microbes don't live in plastic petri dishes with artificial media. Microbes don't grow in these glass uh, flasks which are shaken around at a constant temperature. This is something that we've come up as a way to study them, right? And while that's been super useful to study these microbes on their own, they've made us forget about what those microbes are actually doing out in the environment. And the crazy thing is this particular method, this domestication method of culturing microbes, misses on average 99 to 99% of all microbial diversity. Put another way, when you say, I understand microbiology using the traditional method, you understand somewhere between 0.1 and 1% of microbial life, which you would argue is not a great representation, right? And what's amazing about this is the grandfather, the father of microbiology, this guy, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. 400 years ago, he made these incredible microscopes. Robert Hooke, another great uh, master of micro microscopy, was making these microscopes that looked really fancy and he could magnify things up to maybe 40x, 40 times the magnification. At the same time, this guy who had no scientific training, but just was incredible at grinding glass, was uh, magnifying things to 300 times their size. Right? And what Leeuwenhoek observed by going into his own mouth and by putting it on these, these very primitive microscopes uh, is, is captured here. It's a letter that he sent to one of his friends. And he said, these animalcules were in such enormous numbers that all of the water seemed to be alive. Animalcules is what he back then is, is referring to bacteria and, uh, um, and, and fungi and other types of things that were in his mouth. Um, and this is now also uh, well appreciated. Here's a false color image of the human gut microbiota, the, micro the microbes that live inside the human gut growing on a cellulose fiber. And they're false colored, again, in, in colors to represent the different types of microbes that, are, again, emphasize microbes don't live on their own. They're not pure cultures. They're diverse ecosystems of lots and lots of different types of bugs that not only look different, they also do lots of different things. And somehow we forgot about this for about 400 years. And the main reason we forgot about it is because we decided around the time of Louis Pasteur and around the time of uh, Koch, of the Koch's postulates, some, some names that you might, uh, some of you be familiar with, who decided that microbes are bad, right? This idea of germs, things that are gonna kill us, they're gonna give us disease. And then we became germaphobes, and we decided all microbes were bad, and what we needed to do was devise methods to quickly identify those bad microbes and forgot all of the good microbes out there, okay? Uh, so one way in which you can study microbes is this way that I just told you.
We call them culture dependent methods because to study them, you need to take those microbes and domesticate them, uh, for instance, on a petri dish, right? Uh, now, there's lots of cool things you can do after you've domesticated them. So on a petri dish, which again, many of you may have seen uh, as, a dem as, as a bacterium growing up, once, it's v once you have a little dot there that looks like a microbe uh, that you're visualizing, that's actually not one microbe, that's about a million microbial cells. Because again, remember, the definition of a microbe is that they're microscopic, you can't see them. So after they've amplified up to this, you know, about a million times, now you can see them as a little pinprick. And then you can take that pure culture of a microbe and do lots of cool things. In this day and age, you can sequence the entire genome. So what's the genome? The genome is the collection of all of the DNA. This is the sort of blueprint of life that's in any particular cell. We all have our own genomes. All microbes have their own genomes. We can sequence those genomes as literally read out all of the A, T's, G's, and C's from that single microbe. And then you can use different methods to say what those A, T's, G's, and C's mean and what they do. And then there are other techniques where you can say, okay, I don't want to look at the, the whole genome. You can use this method called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which won Kerry Mullis the Nobel Prize in the 80s, which is a very, very a robust method for going and saying, if I know what I'm looking for, if I'm looking for a very specific segment of DNA, I can go and amplify it, and then I can study it. So as an example, we're going to be talking about antibiotic resistance genes, the pieces of DNA that encode uh, the proteins that break down antibiotics. You can go and PCR on antibiotic resistance genes. So I can now say the E. coli that was causing this person diarrhea, I cultured it up, and I know it has a resistance gene to penicillin. So you can do that, and that's great, right? But as I told you, that represents 0.1% of all microbes. So what happens if you don't have access to methods to easily culture these microbes? You use what are called culture-independent methods. Um, a, 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 another sort of scientific encompassing term for these culture-independent methods is called metagenomics. Metagenomics refers to the fact that you're looking at lots of microbes at the same time, and you're looking at all of their genomes, hence the metagenome. Right? And what we've realized is by sequencing all of the DNA of all of the microbes without culturing them, right, by literally just putting that on a high throughput DNA sequencer, we can then develop com computer models. Those computer models are based on looking at the information that we had from the cultured microbes, and then you make inferences. right? So it's a pattern recognition exercise. You take the microbes, don't grow them up, now you don't have the bias of culture, you get all of their DNA out by sequencing, and then you begin to analyze it. right? These are complementary methods, right? You can't really do this unless you had done some of this, right? And what I'll hopefully show you is you can iterate between these particular ideas for a problem like antibiotic resistance and get a deeper and deeper appreciation of the problem. Okay, we're talking about antibiotics. I'm gonna switch gears now to tell you about the problem we're working on. And it's really important to, to bore down in the definition of what an antibiotic is, right? So an antibiotic, when I'm using the word, is any small molecule, a chemical, which has the ability to either block the growth or kill either bacteria or fungi, right? Both small microscopic organisms. Um, uh, what they are not is they are not a chemical that can do anything to viruses. And why do I bring up this particular point, which the CDC also brings up and the WHO also brings up, is because when we look at antibiotic prescriptions, which are designed against bacteria and fungi, when you look at prescription in the United States, for instance, 30% of those antibiotic prescriptions against viral diseases, which do absolutely nothing to clear the virus, and as I'll show you instead, can cause lots of collateral harm. So that's why the next time you cough or the next time you sneeze, if someone says, aha, you need an antibiotic, I hope you will stop them and say, consult the CDC, consult the WHO, Google the idea, right? It's entirely inappropriate. And the, the real problem, and I, 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 we do a lot of work on, the, on kids in my lab, that's one of the worst populations where we overuse and abuse antibiotics, right? Kids will get you know, sick quite a lot. Um, I have two young boys. Uh, as soon as school starts, I know that I'm gonna start getting sick because they're gonna go to preschool or first grade and bring all those, those disease germs back. And rarely, really, really rarely is that a bacterial infection. Okay, <coughs> so what do antibiotics do? So this is an example of a first slide, but there's a lot of information here that not all of you need to take away. The most important thing to take away from this particular slide is antibiotics go after the most fundamental parts of biological life, right? Uh, there are lots of processes that allow bacteria to live, 
For instance, one process is keeping everything inside the cell, right? These are single cell organisms. They have an outer membrane. If that membrane bursts open, they're going to leak all their guts out and they're going to die, right? Hence, if you design an antibiotic to bust up the outer membrane, that's a good way of killing microbes, right? Then there are these other fundamental processes of life, the idea of converting DNA or reading DNA into this molecule called RNA. Um, and then taking that RNA, that's called transcription, taking that RNA and reading it and turning it into proteins, that's the process of translation. It doesn't matter if you're not familiar with those particular terms, but, but, but believe me that those are what allows life to, 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 to occur. That's what allows a cell to, to, to live. If you go after any of those fundamental processes, the cell can't live. Okay? And so why am I bringing that up? Is because we think of antibiotics, as I just told you, as something to target microbes that cause disease, right? Your E. coli that's causing diarrhea, for instance, uh, the strep infection in your throat. Um, however, those processes, the idea of having a cell wall, the idea of transcribing DNA and translating into proteins are shared by all microbes, right? And so the point I want to bring across with this is that by going after these ultra-conserved processes, every time you deploy an antibiotic into a microbial ecosystem, even though you think you're targeting the pathogen, you're targeting the entire community, right? Uh, a kind of, a, a, a slightly sick analogy would be to say, if you wanted to take out a single person in a city, right? It would be like saying, okay, I'm gonna nuke that city. Uh, because I don't know anything else about who else is in that city, but at least I took that one bad guy out, right? And obviously that's a terrible, terrible thing to do. And that's what we do every time we deploy an antibiotic. So we're here to not only talk about antibiotic, but the problem of antibiotic resistance. And these two famous gentlemen uh, were responsible for two of the earliest antibiotics uh, that we used in the clinic. Okay? And you'll see why their discoveries of antibiotics are tightly linked to the discoveries of antibiotic resistance to their drugs. So Alexander Fleming uh, discovered penicillin. Uh, it was one of the greatest stories of winning a Nobel Prize because you went on vacation and were a little bit sloppy. right? So Fleming goes away, he leaves some petri dishes out of stuff that he's been trying to grow, leaves his window open, then comes back uh, and, and notices the little zones of clearing. Some of the bugs that he's been trying to grow have died. And the reason they've died is because randomly some fungi dropped on there that happened to be producing this compound called penicillin, right? And this happens in 1928, he discovers it. It actually takes two other fellows, Flory and Chain, about a decade to figure out how to overproduce that antibiotic. But here's the thing, it's a natural product. And that's one of the first things I want you to remember about antibiotics. Almost everything that we call an antibiotic as a chemical in the clinic was actually originally discovered as a natural product of another microbe, usually a microbe that was found in the soil. Okay? We've just harnessed that capacity. We've used their warfare agents at high concentrations against pathogens. And here's the crazy thing. Even though he discovered in 28, as I said, it took Florian Chain a while to, to uh, get this treatment out. A lot of people believe that this deployment of antibiotics, of penicillin, was one of the things that changed the tide of the World War, right? the Second World War, because we were now able to treat uh, uh, our infected and wounded soldiers. Here's the crazy thing. The first clinical reports or the first reports of an antibiotic resistance activity against penicillin is from 1929, one year after Fleming discovers penicillin. I hope you're a bit surprised by that. And I hope when you walk out of here, you're going to say, ah, bah, of course that makes sense. Okay, let's go to Gerhard Domach, some of the German uh, dye industry, and discovers that one of these dye derivatives, right, these things to, for dyeing cloth, for instance, uh, sulfonamides happen to be, in this case, a synthetic compound, also an antimicrobial, right? So the sulfonamides, which actually uh, are, are the, one of the oldest class of used antibiotics, are one of the very, very few compounds that were actually dis devised by a synthetic organic chemist, right? They're different from these natural products. First treatment of the sulfonamides, Prontosil in this case, is 1935. And in this case, resistance is reported in the clinic, a pathogen with resistance to Prontosil in 1939. This is a little bit more intuitive, right? You start out, the thing is deployed, and then after a while, resistance occurs. Now here's the rub. This is every single class of antibiotic that we use in the clinic. And across this timeline, this x-axis, are the time that each of these antibiotics was deployed to the clinic. And when that blue shades to red is the first 
report of clinical resistance to that antibiotic. What I want you to take away from this particular slide is that antibiotic resistance in pathogens is not a question of if it'll occur. Antibiotic resistance in pathogens is just a question of when. Because of evolution, because bacteria evolve, because they have massive populations, because eventually we'll get a resistant mutant, there is no such thing as a resistance-proof antibiotic, right? And again, that's one of the sort of depressing parts of today's story. But hopefully it's also something that as soon as we recognize that, we don't get complacent, right? So this is era in, in, in antibiotic history called the golden era of antibiotics, 1940 to 1960. And you'll see, between 1940 and 1960 is the era when almost all of those antibiotics were discovered, right? And every time something got resistant to one of these particular drugs, some other person went into their backyard, or in the case of, of, of the tetracycline went into the field at Mizzou and discovered this cool new drug. So we thought, hey, we're always smarter than these bugs. And then we took our foot off the pedal a little bit in 1960. And we're paying substantial consequences for doing that because the bacteria didn't stop. They continue to get resistant. And now we're getting to the point where people are describing our era as potentially a post-antibiotic era, okay? And this is what this translates to. So here's some really scary numbers, at least scary for me. Currently, and this is likely an underestimate, antibiotic resistant infections kill 700,000 people on our planet. There's an, a report that was commissioned by the UK Prime Minister that said, given all of the current resistance rates, given what is going on with antibiotic development or not going on with antibiotic development, what is the scenario projected to become in 2050, 35 years from the report? And it's reported that that number is gonna turn into 10 million deaths a year around the planet because of our inability to treat those drug resistant infections. Of course, that's the most important number to worry about, the human life, but this also converts into a large amount of money. So currently, the estimated hit to the US economy per year because of drug resistant infections is $55 billion, as billion with a B. Right, yeah, go ahead. On the last slide you had up there, there was 10 major antibiotics that were derived in the golden era. How many of those are derived from soil microbes? Most of them. I thought so. Yep, absolutely, yep. There are very, very few purely chemical classes of antibiotics, and there's a corollary there that things that we call purely synthetic some would argue that those compounds are actually made in the soil as well. We just haven't discovered them yet, right? The best chemists that we know are the microbes. So, All right, so numbers, $55 billion as a hit to the U.S. economy. This is a combination from direct hits, so 8 million hospital days, for instance, as well as all of the lost productivity from those people being out of the workforce. The same U.K. Prime Minister's report said, okay, if we take this, and we scale that to the cumulative hit from now until 2050 to the global economy, how much money are we going to lose? And that is $100 trillion. Now, I don't know what $100 trillion is in terms of, I mean, I know I can multiply that by a billion, right? Um, so I looked it up. What, can I, what, can, what, what kind of terms can I put that in? $100 trillion is to take every cent that the U.S. economy made since 2009 to now and wipe it out, right? We are the largest economy in the world, remember, right? We'd wipe out six years of our GDP, which again, I would argue is not something we should gamble with. Another way to, to put this in perspective, because again, what is 10 million deaths? It's one person dying every three seconds because of an antimicrobial resistant infection, okay? And now for perhaps the most depressing part of this um, is just as these rates of these really, really bad bugs, these multi-drug resistant bugs, so bugs like MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, or VRE, vancomycin resistant enterobacteriaceae, uh, sorry, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. The names don't matter. It's the point that these are bugs for infections where on this scale at least, they're virtually undetectable in, in the 80s and 90s. And now they're going through the roof in terms of their resistance infections. And what's being described as a perfect storm, exactly when we need new compounds, to combat these particular infections is when the pharma industry and the approvals to the FDA is plummeting, right? So we need new drugs against these bad bugs and we don't have them. So there's lots of stuff that can be done. And again, as I said, hopefully I'll shed a little bit of positive light at the end as, as new ways in which to get around this problem. But right now, this is a massive problem. Okay, so 
how do and bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? What are the mechanisms that they use? Okay, so they use one mechanism, which is the mechanism of evolution that all life has access to. It's Darwinian evolution, as described by Charles Darwin. And this is the idea that you will accumulate mutations as an individual, and those mutations that you accumulate during your life will pass on to your children, to your progeny. Now in our case, our lifetimes are 60, 70 years on average. Bacteria divide anywhere between every 30 to 60 minutes. So as you might imagine, those expansions in population are massive, which means a mutation very, very rapidly propagate. So these mutations are generally at random. It's because biology makes mistakes. You're replicating large amounts of your genome. The enzyme that's doing that replication messes something up. You know, so there's going to be some mistake in one of your genes. Now, what happens if one of those mistakes happens to give you an advantage in the context of an antibiotic? That is antibiotic resistance, right? So now, say this mistake microbe, this, this variant, say this was hit with an antibiotic, all of the ones that did a good job with replicating their DNA are now going to get killed by that antibiotic. But this mistake bug is going to start amplifying. That's Darwinian evolution. It's called vertical evolution. And this is something that happens all the time. Right? In microbes, this is something that is the, the reason why you might get resistance during antibiotic treatment. And in fact, even in the very early days of antibiotic treatment, people were shocked to find that patients were turning resistant while they were taking the drug, most likely because of this. Right? Resistance happened, and the resistant guys expanded because all of the wild type, the susceptible guys died. But bacteria can do something that is spectacular. Bacteria in archaea, which is the third kingdom of life, another microscopic uh, kingdom, they can do something called horizontal gene transfer, or horizontal evolution. This is this concept that while you're living as a cell, you can exchange DNA with another living cell, or you can take up naked DNA, DNA that's in the environment. Or another cell can shove its DNA into you. And in doing so, when that DNA moves over, if that DNA encodes a new property, for instance, like antibiotic resistance, in that transfer event, while you're alive, without giving any progeny, without dividing, you've now acquired that trait, which is incredible, right? That would be the equivalent of you exchanging DNA with a strawberry or a banana, right, or a squirrel, and suddenly tasting like a strawberry or smelling like a banana or being annoying like a squirrel, right? Um, so, and of course, you know, we can't do that. We don't have that ability, but they can. And a number of Nobel Prizes were given for recognizing this amazing trait. But the reason I emphasize this here is not to give you a side lecture on evolution or to tell you how awesome bacteria are, is because when you look at the genomes of pathogens, the bugs that cause disease, and you look at their resistance genes, a large amount of them are acquired through this process, right? So while this can absolutely occur, and these go hand in hand, because of the immense selection pressure that's given by exchanging these genes, right, uh, these genes exchange, right? They get selected for. And one thing that I'll emphasize now, which I'll show you data for later on, is large chunks of DNA can move. I keep talking about a gene moving over. You can move a genome over sometime, which is kind of insane, right? Can millions and millions of bases moved over in one single event. But what that means is you can take a microbe that's resistant because of evolution to five different antibiotics, and in one transfer event, convert a completely susceptible microbe into a pan-resistant microbe. And that's really the problem, right? So you don't need lots and lots of time to become resistant to lots of, left, lots of antibiotics. It can happen in a single step. And then once you've passed it on, once you've acquired the resistance, now you can pass it on to all of your progeny, okay? And this is really fundamentally what I'm gonna talk to you about over some of the data slides I'll show you. Ways in which to understand and, and interrogate these genes, these resistance genes that are available for transmission and for moving around. Okay, <coughs> so I told you uh, earlier that most of our culture-based methods, these domestication methods for bringing microbes into the lab, vastly underestimate microbial life, bacterial life. This is against that false color image of the microbiota on a cellulose fiber. What's crazy is that even though I'm gonna tell you mostly about these sort of new age uh, molecular methods, we've known about this underestimation just from microscopy, right? From Leeuwenhoek, but then there's this really cool experiment in the 80s by these uh, uh, two scientists, Staley and Konopka, who did something very clever. They took uh, water and environmental samples, uh, they diluted them out so that they could 
figure out how many cells they could visualize as live cells on a microscope. And then they also put them through this dilution series on a petri dish. That is to say, I'm going to take my sample, I'm going to dilute by 10, I'm going to dilute that by 10, I'm going to dilute that by 10, plate each of those things out on a petri dish and figure out, okay, at my fourth dilution, I had 10 cells. Now I need to multiply that by 10,000. That was the total number of cells in my original sample, right? And when they got that estimate, when they compared that to what was actually visibly alive in the media, they again confirmed that they were off by culture by 100 to 1,000 fold, right? So really we're underestimating microbial diversity. And what happens when you underestimate the things that are out there? You're gonna underestimate their functions. If you don't know them, you don't know what they're doing. And we're talking about antibiotic resistance here, and that directly translates. And our lab has shown this over and over again, right? So when you look, for instance, at fecal samples from humans or soil samples, if you apply this culturing bias, so you first take those samples, and out of the fecal sample, the stool sample, you culture up the microbes, or out of the soil sample, you culture up the microbes, and then say, who are the resistance genes? Most of the genes you find uh, are ones that have previously been described, which makes sense, right? These are the ones that are easy to look at. They're the ones that are in the databases. So if they've been looked at over and over again, they've been well represented. So I'm basically rediscovering what people knew before. But if I now go to exactly the same samples, don't do the culture-based work, but do these culture-independent methods. And I'll tell you about a specific method that we use in a second. Same samples, now looking at the uncultured majority. You get the same types of genes out, the same resistance properties against all of the clinically important antibiotics, but almost everything you find is new. Or another way to put it is, almost everything that's here has not been described before. Okay? And this follows directly again from the fact that if you didn't know who was there, you don't know what they're doing. Okay. So in this day and age, those of you who are even slightly familiar with uh, sort of scientific jargon, you'll know that everyone likes to make their own ohm. Right, the genome, the metagenome, the transcriptome, the proteome. And so we're not going to get left out in the antibiotic resistance field. We have our antibiotic resistome. And I'll use that term a little bit. Um, and what it really in this case refers to is when I'm talking about any collection of microbes, cultured or uncultured, the antibiotic resistome is the collection of all antibiotic resistance genes in that particular sample. It's just an easy term to use there rather than saying, the collection of antibiotic resistance genes in the sample. Resisto, right? Okay, so what, what do I do? What techniques do I have available to me if you brought me a particular sample, a soil sample, a fecal sample, a single microbe, to tell you what all of the resistance genes are in that sample? Well, so clearly I can go back to the old school method of domestication, right? I can bring the microbe out. If it's easy to culture, that's a good way to go. Certainly if you're sick and it's a well-known microbe, you want your clinical lab to be able to do this. And then you can figure out what genes are in there. You can sequence it, et cetera, et cetera. I also told you about this method where in a culture independent fashion, that cult uncultured majority, you can just go and sequence all of the DNA in the remaining microbes. So that's a method called shotgun sequencing or shotgun metagenomic sequencing. It's called that method because you break apart all of the DNA, you sequence small chunks of it uh, on these massive machines. Well, actually now the machines are pretty small, but on high throughput machines. Uh, and you know they don't have culture bias. You can s keep sequencing as long as you have money to do it. Um, and you, you can do lots of things about this uncultured majority, but here's the problem. Even though you're expanding the pie, you're only expanding the known pie. And why is that? <coughs> it's because how are you gonna know that this resistance gene is a resistance gene? You're gonna have to compare it to some database, right? And the only database is going to be those genes that you already knew were resistance. So you get kind of stuck in a little bit of a catch-22 situation, right? You know these genes. You can compare this new DNA to these genes and say, okay, I found it. But you can never tell if a new gene has come up because how do you know it's a resistance gene, right? And it's to expand that cryptic unknown part of the resistance gene pie that our lab has been working on a particular technique. The technique was actually described by the person who invented the name metagenomics. Her name is Joe Handelsman. Up until recently, she was a science advisor to President Obama. She's now going back to, uh, 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 back to her position at Yale as a professor. And Joe developed this amazing technique called functional metagenomics, Joe and her colleagues. Uh, now, functional metagenomics, which I'll go into a little bit of gory detail uh, in the next couple slides. The important part, if you, if you completely uh, uh, you know, zone out during that period, is to know that the, the value of functional metagenomics is to add to this known resistome the unknown part, right? 
It's to expand the unknown, to make the unknown known. And what's neat about that is, remember I talked about iteration, that these methods talk to each other. As soon as the unknown becomes known, I can now use shotgun metagenomics the next time around to call that the known, right? So hopefully at some point we'll put ourselves out of business so that we'll know enough about the unknowns that we can just use the known techniques. We're not quite there yet. So what is functional metagenomics? Uh, and again, just bear with me here. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep this uh, as understandable as possible. So I told you about metagenomes. This is the collection of all DNA in a particular microbial sample. The first thing you do is you extract it. It's the same thing you would do for shotgun sequencing. But now rather than sequencing that DNA, you're gonna do something that is helped by the revolution of recombinant DNA. The idea of taking DNA out of whatever source and cloning it into another organism. Now I hope that sounds familiar. That's basically horizontal gene transfer, right? It's taking DNA from one source, putting it in another microbe, and causing it to do something. And that's actually exactly what functional metagenomics is. It's an artificial horizontal gene transfer test, except it's high throughput, and it's unbiased. So what do you do now is you take this DNA, you break it down into the size pieces that you know encode approximately one to a few genes. Why do you do this? Because it just becomes easier later on if you have a single gene, and you know what it does to so say, well, that gene did this particular function. Okay, then you go through some techniques where you are able to take lots and lots, in this case, millions and millions of these random chunks of DNA. And it's important to note they're random. You're not defining them. You're just bringing them out from this gamish. You're cloning them into some expression system and you're putting them into a microbe that's very easy to use. And our lab, we use the microbe E. coli. It's sort of the workhorse of the microbial world. And now what we've done is done this massive horizontal gene transfer experiment where millions of different E. coli cells, right? these are microbes, have in them some random chunk of horizontally gene transferred DNA. So that's the metagenomic part of it, the metagenomic library. The functional part of it comes from the fact that now I can take these E. coli and domesticate. I can take those recombinant E. coli cells and put them on a Petri dish, and that Petri dish happens to have an antibiotic at a concentration that will kill untransformed E. coli. So what's gonna happen is most of my E. coli is actually gonna get killed. Right? But what's going to come through, the only things that will get, that are able to survive now on that antibiotic are any E. coli cells that picked up a chunk of DNA that is an antibiotic resistance gene. Now, of course, the devil is in the details after that. You have to do a lot of sequencing and a lot of computational work to figure out what those things are. But the, if you, again, if you completely zoned out of any of the sort of, uh, you know, jargony details, what does this technique give you? It gives you the ability to completely ignore of anything about your a priori information about what DNA is coming in. All you know is it comes from this source. And after pumping it through this pipeline, you get a nice list of antibiotic resistance genes. And you did not need to know what those antibiotic resistance genes were beforehand. So that's the discovery platform, right? You've gone through a model of horizontal gene transfer, and you've said each of these genes knocks out specific antibiotics in, in E. coli. Now what my lab has done over the last seven or eight years it's taking this basic engine <coughs> and married it to what I call next generation and now second generation sequencing. And really all that is is other people getting clever about how to sequence DNA faster and cheaper. We took those techniques and made this faster and cheaper. And we also developed computational algorithms, computer programs to make this part, the part of actually taking that sequence data and saying it's this particular function. We made that a little bit better as well, right? So that's what this next slide shows you. That's the main engine of functional metagenomics. That's the cloning part, putting it in E. coli and selecting it. And what I'm showing you here is that you can do this many, many, many times over. And then you can do something that we do in, in grocery stores. We can barcode, right? That's how I can tell without, you know, really, you, you go in and you strip away all of the information about your Cheerios box or your Special K box, but you can still just scan this barcode and say, okay, I know what this is. And we can do the same thing, and in our case, it's not a barcode which we actually slap onto DNA, because that'd be very hard since it's a liquid. Um, but instead, what we do is we actually tag on more DNA onto it. But in this case, it's a defined DNA sequence, right? So I say, okay, out of this particular selection, I'm gonna put on a particular sequence, ATGGCCA, for instance, and I'll make sure that that is different from this particular reaction and this particular reaction. Run all those reactions together, Right? Take all of those discovered antibiotic resistance genes. Now I could throw them together, put them on a sequencer, 
And now when the DNA comes out, the first thing I do is I read that barcode. And because I have that barcode, I can say, aha, that first barcode I recognize because I put it in, into the first well. And that happens to be a penicillin resistance selection from soil number one. And the second one happens to be a cephalosporin selection from fecal sample number two. So again, all I'm wanting to emphasize here is that these cool tricks that come out of a genomics revolution are the ability to sequence lots and lots of DNA. And by using these barcoding strategies, you can take a large number of experiments, put them together, and then split them back up again, and then analyze them separately, right? Okay, now again, imagine that you zone out of all of that. What's the punchline here? It's to say this old technique from 1998, we've been able to reduce the cost of it by about 100 fold by applying new sequencing technologies. And either that means that you can use the same amount of money and do 100 times as many experiments, which is how we've done it, or you can do the same experiment for a hundredth of the cost, right? The reason we take the same amount of money and do 100 times as many experiments is you got a lot of power from that type of statistical analysis, right? I can take one sample and look at it 100 times. I can look at a person's fecal sample, for instance, over their you know, course of taking antibiotics and see how their resistance genes change. Okay. Now, back to this cartoon schematic. So now we're going to dive into a couple of, of vignettes. Uh, now is where it might get a little bit scary, because <laughs> you might see uh, a lot of data. But again, I'm going to try to keep it at why you should care. So again, this is uh, my cartoon schematic of different habitats that I would argue are important not only for microbial transmission, which is how I introduced them earlier, but for the transmission network of antibiotic resistance genes. Again, what I mean by that is, all microbes have resistance genes. You'll see that towards the end. Just, I'm going to sort of spoil the thunder right now. Ev, there's resistance everywhere, <laughs> right? Which means that if I dump antibiotics into agriculture, I'm going to amplify those resistance genes, and they're going to be available to every other habitat, right? So keep that, in, that, that idea in mind. Selection in one habitat can have consequences in another habitat. I use the word habitat. You might be used to that from sort of uh, you know planet Earth as uh, you know, a jungle or a forest. Every one of us is a habitat, right? We have trillions of microbes in, in, in our bodies. Uh, it, a, a kind of facetious way to look at it is we're big bags of microbes, right? They're using us to get from one habitat to the other. Uh, they've been around for millions of years, billions of years before us. Yeah? So you use microbes to find more microbes? Because you're using E. coli to find like the that's a, great, that's a great way to think about it. We're using, I'll use an engineering term because we also use E. coli as, a, as an engineering model. We're using it as a chassis, right? What we're saying is E. coli is an easy microbe to work with. If I want to discover something, I'm going to put the DNA into E. coli and ask it what that DNA is doing. And when I'm saying asking it, I'm using sort of human terms here. What I'm doing is I'm going to subject it to some kind of selection or screen um, I might, for instance, put in a piece of DNA from a coral, right? And I know that coral happens to be fluorescent. And I want to find out what is the protein that allows that coral to be fluorescent. So I might take all of the DNA from that coral, break it up into small chunks, put it in an E. coli, and then screen each of the E. coli transformants to the one that are glowing. Now I've discovered the fluorescence protein. Uh, three dudes won a Nobel Prize for doing exactly that, by the way. Um, so. Uh, you know, green fluorescent protein and the whole rainbow of proteins we have. It changed biology. Um, so, but, but absolutely, we are using microbes, the ones that are easy and domesticated and easy to work with, to discover the unknown. Um, so here's our potential resistome exchange map. And I'm going to walk through a couple habitats that perhaps are not obvious when you're thinking of resistance and tell you why they are important. And I'm going to start with the soil. And there were a couple questions already that alluded to the fact that antibiotics are made by soil microbes. So hope that already sets in motion why you might expect to find resistance in the soil. Okay. Now the idea of soil having resistance genes or soil microbes having resistance genes is fairly old. When we got to this problem, I want to highlight three particular papers that really were influential for the way we think of the ecology of antibiotic resistance. One was this amazing paper from Jerry Wright's group, published in 2011 where they went into the Canadian Beringian permafrost. And they used cores right, um, to go into this, this, this permafrost region to, to a point where they could carbon date the, the region that they had gone to to be 30,000 years old. Right? So now they know that the samples they're looking at are 30,000 years old. And then they take those samples and they sequence their DNA. 
and they make sure that they look at DNA that they know would be coming from the animals uh, or the insects or whatever in that era, and then they zoom in on the microbial genes that are there, and they're able to suddenly find resistance genes against penicillin, tetracycline, minocycline, vancomycin. And what this means is, in this one awesome experiment, they've proven that antibiotic resistance predates human use of antibiotics. So we should not be surprised that antibiotic resistance to penicillin was found a year before penicillin was, or years before penicillin was deployed in the clinic. This was around 30,000 years before anyone thought of looking at penicillin, okay? So why is that the case? Well, there's this amazing theory put forward by Julian Davies and colleagues, now over 40 years ago, called the producer hypothesis. And what this says is, since all of the, almost all of the antibiotics we use in the clinic come from soil-dwelling microbes, right? Mostly these streptomycetes and actinomycetes. Um, it makes sense that since they've had these production capacities for millions to hundreds of millions of years, that resistance is at least that old. And why is that? This goes back to one of the earliest intro slides I showed you. Think of what the antibiotics are doing. They're going after the most conserved processes. So if these particular microbes produced that compound and they didn't have resistance to it, they would immediately commit suicide, right? They would go in, they'd be like, oh wow, I found this compound, boom, it's suddenly fallen apart, right? Yep. Okay, so um, in one of like, your earlier slides, uh, you showed the, uh, I think it was a graph, sort of. Showing the uh, evolution of, of it, yep. The evolution of the antibiotics. And I sort of noticed that a lot of the antibiotics, like you said, were in the golden area. Not golden area, golden era, sorry. Um, <coughs> of a lack of new antibiotics being discovered, like people not trying to discover them? That's a great question. Just the fact that there aren't anymore. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a question of um, probability, right? Uh, or I should say, it's a question of frequency. The reason people kept finding antibiotics, right, is because the first person who went to do this, uh, this guy, Selman Waxman, uh, he won a Nobel Prize for streptomycin, one of the early aminoglycoside antibiotics. So the, the recent estimate is now, if you go to streptomycetes from the soil, you'll find streptomycin-like molecules made by one in every 10 streptomycetes. Quite common, right? Then you go to the second generation of discovered streptomycetes, you're going to start finding it about one in 100. Next generation, one in 1,000. And then you start getting to these technological limits where if you screen a million different bacteria of that particular type, almost everything you find is what you found before. So it's not the fact that those antibiotics don't exist. It's just that our traditional methods of culturing, remember that traditional methods only get us the 1%, right? After a while, that 1% gets saturated and you don't find anything new. So something I'm not gonna talk to you about today, but there was a cool paper last year where, where uh, uh, Kim Lewis from Northeastern University in Boston has figured out co new ways in which to coax bacteria that are hard to culture from the soil to now get cultured up. And he screened uh, 10,000 such hard to culture bugs and found a completely new me mechanism of antibiotics, right? So it is true that one of the reasons that the golden era sort of came to a sudden stop was because we just tapped out. We couldn't screen any more uh, uh, um, uh, uh, bugs. But it's also mixed with the fact that we just thought, and we've got so many antibiotics, once it becomes resistant, we'll just swap the antibiotics out, and that turned out to be a bad, bad plan. Okay, so this makes sense, right? The producers themselves need to have resistance, but because they've been around for millions of years putting the antibiotics in the soil, they've also given all of their neighbors the evolutionary pressure to become resistant too. So what the producer hypothesis posits is that these natural microbes, the producers and their neighbors, are the original evolutionary progenitors. They're the, they're the source of antibiotic resistance. Okay? And then finally, in cases where people have archival soils, so soils that have been stored, in this case in Europe, every year, sort of religiously, in this case over 70 years, people went back in these European soils and tried to detect the levels of antibiotic resistance. And they found that in every one of these cases, the levels had gone up concomitant with the era of antibiotic use in humans. That is to say, you have this correlational evidence that as we started using antibiotics, resistance even in the environment started going up, okay? So what do these kind of three things put together suggest? Well, what they suggested to us
is that almost every antibiotic we find in the clinic should be, the, should be found as an identical copy to things you find in the soil, right? This is strongly pointing towards this, uh, uh, this, this hypothesis that all of the genes that our pathogens have, they acquire from this huge reservoir of antibiotic resistance genes. Now let's turn that into genetic speak. If the genes that we find in pathogens are the same that we should find in the soil, it means that their DNA sequence should be identical, right? They should literally have the same A, T's, G's, and C's as you find in a soil microbe and a pathogen. And yet, we, when we looked at the databases, didn't find such evidence. Almost all of the antibiotic resistance that have been seen in, the so in, in, in pathogens was very, very different from genes that have been found in the soil, even though people have been looking at these two things at the same time. So this suggests one of two possibilities. One is that this is a true hypothesis. But in evolutionary terms, the pathogens and the soil bugs diverged a really long time ago, right? So they acquired those resistance genes a really long time ago, and now they're not talking to each other, so they're mutating in different rates, and that's why they don't see each other. That would suggest that they're not talking to each other. That means there's no exchange going on between those habitats. The other hypothesis is we've not been using the right techniques. We haven't been looking at the right bugs, and we, having uh, at that point no experience with the soil decided hey you know scientists have a lot of hubris let's go with the second hypothesis that maybe other people haven't looked at this hard enough um, and fortunately we were right or maybe unfortunately um, so we did this kind of bizarre experiment uh, this is when i was a postdoc in boston we went to 11 different u.s soils at different levels of uh, human contact and we did a culturing experiment in this case, we are actually using culture to our advantage because we decided maybe the reason people haven't found this smoking gun is because there are so many bugs in the soil and there's so much resistance there that we haven't focused on the things that are transmitting between the environment and pathogens. So let's culture up the type of bugs that look like bugs in the clinic. So let's try to find the type of bugs in the soil that are most like bugs in the clinic and maybe they'll have exchanged through. And because the feature we're looking for is antibiotic resistance, we took these soil microbes, in this case just the soils, and we put them in media at ex exceptionally high concentrations of antibiotics, right? So this 1,000 micrograms a mil, you don't know what that means in any kind of real terms, that is 50 times the concentration that defines clinical resistance for most of these antibiotics. Another way to think about this is most of, for most of these compounds, at that concentration, they would crystallize in your blood, right? exceptionally high concentrations of antibiotics. We being naive, decided that we'd do this because we wanted to screen through lots of soils and find those few weirdos that were able to do this. Unfortunately, bacteria are sort of chemically smarter than we are. And in this, this grid of 11 soils by 18 antibiotics, in virtually every case, we found massively drug resistant uh, uh, bugs. And we went through lots of passaging experiments. And for the purposes of this talk, what we did was we took 95 representative cultures so 95 representative tubes out of these thousands of tubes across this 11 by 18 grid, and we extracted all of the DNA out, right? So this is now again a metagenome, but it's a metagenome of a very special type of microbe. It's a type of microbe that we know upfront is exceptionally drug resistant, and it's growing in the type of culture media that we use to domesticate pathogens. So two features that we think will give us our smoking gun. And then two graduate students, both now no longer at WashU, uh, they're both, uh, uh, Alejandro uh, uh, was a computational biology student, he's now a professor in Columbia, and Kevin, uh, who's a graduate student in genetics in my lab, is a postdoc in Seattle. They applied this method, this functional metagenomic method, to say, what are the resistance genes in these 95 cultures? And what they were able to find was 10 pieces of evidence, 10 resistance genes from those soil microbes that were 100% identical to resistance genes that have been found in disease-causing microbes. So in one experiment, right, multiplying by 10 the amount of evidence that had previously existed for resistance genes being exchanged between benign, that is non-pathogenic bacteria in the environment, and pathogens. Now don't worry about any of these complicated details up here, they're just the names of the genes. But what I want to tell you is that between those 10 genes, they knock out five different classes of antibiotics. Not just five antibiotics, five classes of antibiotics. We don't have a lot of classes of antibiotics, but 10 or 12, right? Um, between them, they represent all of the known major resistance mechanisms that pathogens have. So pathogens can be resistant, but they only have a few ways of doing it, right? They can pump out the drug, they can break the drug down, they can protect their target. Um, between those 10 genes, they're able to do all of those things. 
And then, the, this is the scariest part of all of this. Remember I told you we went to 11 different US soils. And they were actually only from three states, from Minnesota, uh, from Pennsylvania, and from Massachusetts. And yet, the pathogens that those resistance genes were identical to from all around the world, right? So shaded in dark are all of the countries where some researcher had gone and deposited a pathogen into a database and said it had X resistance gene, which is the same resistance genes as one of our US soil bugs, okay? Um, and then, remember, think back to horizontal gene transfer. We wanted to understand what these genes looked like, right? So we compared them to databases. Again, lots of stuff on this slide, but let me orient you. Down here are the pieces of DNA that we sequenced out of the soil bugs. They represent, in this case, I'm showing you four examples, resistance to four very different compounds, all clinically relevant antibiotics. And what I'm showing you now is a comparison between those genes, their sequences, and a whole bunch of really nasty pathogens. Right? These are from databases of pathogens. And what we think we've discovered is not just sharing of single genes with single bugs, but actually a resistance gene cluster or a multi-drug resistance gene cluster. And this goes back to what I told you is the threat of horizontal gene transfer. This suggests that we don't know the directionality of transfer, but we suggest that transfer occurred between benign soil bugs and many of these particular pathogens, right? And we can even tell that it has probably gone through horizontal gene transfer because in red are the genes that we know are antibiotic resistance genes but in yellow are a different set of genes which we know actually move DNA around. They're called mobilization elements. They're really clever. They encode enzymes that can go and cut between those two pieces of DNA and move things over. So what we think we've discovered is a multi-drug resistant cassette, which in this case, between us in a single transfer event, could, could transfer resistance to four classes of antibiotics. Okay, so uh, we were happy to solve the puzzle. We were sad to find this out. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is we said, no, we kind of did a bizarre experiment, right? Who takes antibiotics uh, or bugs on the soil and puts them in crystallization quantities of antibiotics? Well, apparently we do, um, but no one else does, and that's probably not a terribly natural environment, right? So we wanted to ask this bizarre finding that we had, that this very specific type of bacterium, these are, they were proteobacteria, that's just the sort of Latin Greek name for that group of bugs. Uh, these bugs from the soil, which are non-pathogenic, we know that they're exchanging resistance genes with modern pathogens, so we know that exists. What we wanna know is, is that the rule or the exception? Is that that weird experiment we did, does that represent something that's happening all the time? Do we really need to be freaking out about the soil? Or was that something that was, uh, you know, hopefully just a, a, a small vein that we did discover, but it's not a, a, a cause for, uh, so Kevin now, the same guy who did the earlier work, teamed up with Sanket Patel in the lab to address it at larger scale. Okay. Now to address this, we teamed up with other scientists, and again, I keep saying you know, team science, so Rob Knight and Noah Fear, uh, two microbial ecologists over at the University of Colorado at that time. Uh, and what they had done is they had gone to Minnesota and Michigan, and they had accessed what's called the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. This is an amazing collection of habitats all around the country, which have been reserved for research, and mostly what people do is they study plants on those particular plots. But uh, uh, people obviously care about more than plants, and so these are microbial ecologists. They're looking at the ecology, but now below the soil in terms of what's living in there. So they had already analyzed 18 different soils, actually many more. We accessed 18 soils, nine from the, Michigan, uh, from the Minnesota side, nine from the Michigan side. And what they had in, in their hands already from those soils was the identity of the microbes in those 18 soils. I'm not gonna go through the details of how they did that. It's, called, it's a technique called 16S phylogeny. Uh, but take my word for the fact that they had a good robust method of saying, in this soil, here's the laundry list of who's there. And it's in a way that's done without culturing, so you really know who's there, right? Uh, both the culture and the uncultured. What Kevin and Sanket did was they took that same source of soils, put it through that functional metagenomics pipeline that we have, and asked what resistance genes are in those same soils. And from those 18 soils, they discovered 3,000 antibiotic resistance genes. Okay, so what's 3,000 antibiotic resistance genes? Well, there's a very cleverly named resistance database called the Antibiotic Resistance Database. Um, and at the time that they discovered these 3,000 unique antibiotic resistance genes, uh, the size of the antibiotic resistance gene database or, uh, was 15,000 genes. That is, every single resistance gene that anyone ever found before 
They've just found a fifth of that in 18 US soils. Okay? So really emphasizing, we really haven't looked hard enough at the resistome out there. So the next couple things are a little bit complicated in terms of what the plots show. Uh, what I'm gonna try to distill down to you, uh, for you is, we were able to compare the information about who's there to what they were doing, okay? And so what I want you to take from here is that in each of the cases when you see these two dots connected, that's basically some of this data represents who's there, the other rep data represents the resistance genes that are in there. Why is this an interesting way to look at the data? It's because you can show it's in statistical methods that if these paired dots are closer together as opposed to randomly associated with each other, it means that by understanding who's there, you can predict what they're doing. But that might seem really intuitive. Why is that a, a particularly interesting discovery? Well, here's the deal. If horizontal gene transfer was occurring, it would obscure this particular plot, right? The only reason you can say if I know who's there, I know what it's doing, is because I'm assuming in that case the DNA is not moving around. But if it starts moving around, then the DNA from one organism is gonna look like the DNA from the other organism. So one inference from this analysis, this is called an ordination plot, um, one inference from this is to say, maybe, maybe most of this uncultured majority has a lot of resistance genes clearly, but they're kind of selfish. They're keeping the resistant genes to themselves, which for us is fantastic, right? So what is another way that we can actually test for this? Remember I showed you in the earlier slides that you can look for these genes that are called mobilization elements. We can look for antibiotic resistance genes and we can look at the frequency that the next to genes that move them around. The prediction you would make if horizontal gene transfer was happening all the time, you would say resistance genes are always next to these mobilization elements because that's evidence that they've moved around. If you don't find that evidence, you can say maybe the resistance genes occur, but they're no longer part of this mobilization. And that's exactly what we're able to find and confirm this. What Kevin was able to do in his analysis is he counted the frequency of the resistance genes in his soil selections in this work said, every time I see a resistance gene, how often do I see a mobilization element next to it? And compare that to the frequency of known pathogens. And what he was able to clearly show is you always see way more co-localizations of resistance and mobilization and pathogens than you ever see in the soil. Okay, so now let's distill all that back. What does that mean? So our model currently is that luckily, even though there are tons and tons of resistance genes in microbes in the soil, most of those genes are not available for easy horizontal gene transfer. That's the reason they're not willy-nilly popping up into pathogens. However, there is this frightening minority, right? The, 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 the multi-drug resistant proteobacteria that happen to be the gesundheit, uh, uh, conduit between the environment and the clinic. And indeed, it makes sense when you look at what type of bugs those are, they have this incredible capacity to also live in different habitats. Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Burkholderia. These are the type of bugs that can somehow not only live in the soil and also in our lungs and our guts, but they can live in our ventilation systems. They can colonize catheters. They can colonize everything in hospital surfaces. They happen to be disinfectant resistant. So they have this amazing capacity to cross habitats and unfortunately also this amazing capacity to move resistance genes around. So even though that's bad news, the good part of that news is that at least we know who they are so we can design diagnostics to go after them, okay? So the next thing I'm gonna tell you about is a really brief vignette to say, uh, we do lots of lots of the same type of work in different habitats. We do this in humans in terms of uh, uh, fecal samples over time. But one story that was the culmination uh, for us in our lab at least, of looking at lots and lots of habitats over time was something that was run by two gra recent graduates, Erica Persson from genetics and Pablo Sukayama from microbiology where they decided to look at both humans and their environments over time uh, in terms of what microbes they had and what resistance genes that they had. But in this particular case, they happened to look in habitats that are fairly understudied. Specifically, they, uh, Erica looked at a village in El Salvador of subsistence farmers, and Pablo looked at a peri-urban slum outside Lima, Peru. Okay, so why did they do this? So we're in the era of microbiome studies. It's a really hot field, right? This idea of microbes and microbial communities, mostly good or at least benign in our bodies, doing cool things for us. Uh, people describe the microbiome or the microbiota as another organ, which I think is an appropriate way to think about it. Um, 
And people have gone out everywhere they can and sequenced the microbiomes in humans. But actually when you say they've gone everywhere, they've been kind of biased about that, right? They've, you think of this thing called the Human Microbiome Project. It's an awesome project that uh, the NIH funded for five years. You know what it actually is? It's the American Microbiome Project. It's not the Human Microbiome Project because we only looked at people in America. But then another awesome project came around called MetaHit, another you know, global microbiome project. No, 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 the European Microbiome Project. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've really sampled the westernized rich part of the world. So a couple of researchers decided, no, 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 that's not good. We need to go and look at the other side of the extreme. So then they went after hunter-gatherers, right? People in remote locations. We were part of a study uh, that sequenced uh, the microbiomes of uh, Amazonian villages at first contact, right? How someone managed to convince someone at first contact to give them a fecal sample is still beyond me. Um, uh, but our colleagues did it. I was not involved with that. Uh, I just sequenced it. But still, across all of those amazing studies, they represent a tiny fraction of the world's population. Those hunter-gatherers are one extreme. The westernized industrialized nations are another extreme. And two-thirds of the population sits in between, right? The rural uh, uh, folks, uh, subsistence farmers, all the way through urbanization in the developing world. So we decided to design a study to go after that population to figure out, are they somewhere between those extremes, right? And in particular, because when you look at antibiotic use, most antibiotic use occurs in within those extremes, right? The hunter-gatherers have no antibiotics, at least at that time. The sad thing is we found out as soon as the people on the outside came to those hunter-gatherers, the first thing they had to do was give them antibiotics, because otherwise they want to make them sick, right? Um, and of course, we use a lot of antibiotics here in the US and in Europe, but there's nothing compared to antibiotic use in, in Asia and South America, and Australia for some bizarre reason. Um, but so anyway, so, so Erica and Pablo designed this really cool set of studies where they were able to collect samples, in this case from, ten diff uh, from a subsistence village in El Salvador, from, uh, from every household over a two-year period. And then in Pablo's case, it was from this peri-urban shanty town, 10 different households uh, across an economic gradient, and also samples were collected over time. We collected them because they represent most of the gl global population the standards of hygiene that are low, so there's high risk of infectious disease and transmission, and lots and lots of antibiotics. In Peru, for instance, uh, if you're a kid below 13 years of age, you can get antibiotics for free, right? In both El Salvador and, uh, and Peru, antibiotics don't require a prescription. Uh, you can just go and buy it because you think you want it. Um, and a lot of people think they want it. So they analyzed a large number of samples. This is a large part of two PhD projects. Uh, they have 500 samples they looked at, uh, roughly half of them from 115 individuals from these about 30 houses, and then equivalent environmental samples. And when environmental, I say, we try to collect everything under the sun we could, right? So the soils in the, in the, in the hutments, we looked at the water they were drinking, but in particular, we also looked at their wastewater treatment plants. So in El Salvador, Erica got access to the composting latrines that they used. They, she got also access to the farms where they take the composted material and put it on the farms to look for transmission routes. <coughs> any subsistence animals, any pets. The only pets we weren't able to use were, pe were um, pet parrots in Peru because there's a USDA risk of bringing some disease thing in. So we didn't look at the parrots. Um, and then in Peru, uh, the wastewater treatment plant was a little bit mo more modern. It's a type of UV treatment plant that we use here. Okay? Um, so just, well, there's a lot of stuff in this particular dense paper. I'm going to make two points, or three points. One is, here's another one of those ordination plots. Again, really what you want to take away from this is every single dot represents the microbiome of a single person. Okay? And without getting into the mathematics details, because this is actually an n-dimensional space, which most of us can't think of beyond three, I can't think of beyond three dimensions. Uh, at least in this particular two-dimensional representation, the closer together two dots are, the more shared microbes you have, right? So if you're overlapping, you have exactly the same. If you're far apart, you don't have the same type of microbes. And what we're doing here is we're comparing our data to that Western data I told you about, so Americans, and also to the hunter-gatherers. And exactly as we predicted, with those extreme lifestyles, those two particular microbiome data sets by other people are very, very far apart, uh, far apart from each other. And then what we looked at is right in between. And in fact, the El Salvador microbiomes, the ones that are these subsistence farmers, look a little bit closer to the hunter-gatherers. And the folks in this urban 
uh, slum look a little bit closer to the Americans. So really telling us that lifestyles and cultural traditions are dominant features of what type of microbes we have. Okay? But what we did find was, when you look at, just say, what, let's just finish this point in there. What we did find was, as again you might expect, because Peruvian use of antibiotics is so high, they had per capita way more antibiotic resistance genes than any one of the other habitats, right? So again, kind of intuitive, right? You use a lot of antibiotics, you're gonna enrich for antibiotic resistance genes in your gut microbiota. I'll also mention that one of the big differences between the Peruvian data set and the El Salvadoran data set is the population density. So the closer you are, the more you're gonna probably transmit. The population density in the Peruvian slum was 80 times the population density in, in the El Salvadoran set. So this is again intuitive, sorry. Maybe a different view of when you say that people in Latin America and uh, Peru, uh, they buy the prescription, the medicine without prescription. But because the business of pharmaceutical, they haven't, uh, they don't have too many cells. So people, most of the time, they reach for natural resources instead of medication. So obviously, the pharmaceutical business say they don't need prescriptions, so we want to sell. But uh, that's a different view. Uh, a lot of people in different countries, in different cultures, they, because they don't have the money for medication, they have the alternative of looking for natural resources as uh, plants and other things and which are really helpful and uh, they are resistant to many other things. And actually, uh, I take my children with Dr. Arroyo, who is uh, from Puerto Rico, and I feel comfortable with her because she tells me, okay, you, you, it's okay, we don't, your kids don't need to take medication, let's go to try this tea and other options, which are natural resources. And uh, I just feel like, why, if it's the same in other countries, and they are no, I don't know, I think you're, in other countries it's the same, or how it is in? So I think you bring up a, a bunch of interesting points that are germane to this. One is the fact that there are certainly non-allopathic remedies that people use all around the world. Um, we don't access in this particular study those particular remedies. We don't have that information. So while that might certainly be at play, uh, and there's lots of you know questions about how does you know sort of allopathic you know commercial small molecule uh, uh, therapy compared to those, that's a very interesting question. And there are people looking at those impacts in the microbiota. That's outside the space of what we're looking at here. When I talk about the correlation between antibiotic use and antibiotic resistance, that comes from data that's collected from the amount of antibiotic use in Peru. That's it, right? So all we know is that if we look at antibiotic use, prescription and non-prescription around the world, right, it's increased by 37% between 2000 and 2010. And the lion's share of that increase has been in the developing world. Uh, a lot of that is India and China. Right? That's where a lot of the, the, uh, the generic antibiotics are made. But there's a large amount of increase also in South America. So there's no question that are confounding factors in terms of other natural, other types of non-traditional remedies. But in this particular case, since we're focusing on, on, on the resistance to these chemicals, it happens to correlate with the use of those chemicals. Actually, I remember my grandma telling me, um, telling my, uh, my cousins, let the kids play in the mud and because they develop Better to other, uh, there's no question that there's now a finer appreciation for what's called the hygiene hypothesis, right? That perhaps a lot of what we consider kind of Western maladies, asthma, uh, allergies, lots of things that we somehow seem to have had an uptick over the last 20, 30 years may have been because we went a little bit too far in our germophobia. We got out of the environment, which means that our immune system, which is highly, highly immature early, did not get all of the exposure, not to bad bugs, but all of the good bugs that were around, and then it got hyper-reactive, right? The immune system is, is, is very finely tuned, right? If it gets immunosuppressed, you're gonna get infections. 
But if you go too far, that's the, the basis of all sorts of autoimmune and other types of immune disorders. So that, yeah, that's, that's an entirely different space of, of microbiome research. And in fact, as a corollary, one of the things that we find is indeed in these habitats, while I'm only describing antibiotic resistance, as you get further and further away from industrialized humans, the diversity of the microbiota seems to increase. So this comes again to the possibility that over time, with our, again, sort of germophobe hats on, and with our loss of interaction with the environment and with animals and each other, we've actually caused mass extinctions of important microbes in our microbiota. I would just say that, just so you go away from here, that's a hypothesis, right? We do not have causal relationships between diversity of the microbiota and anything. It, those are just those are things that are very interesting to study that just haven't been proven yet. So the final thing I'll say about this was, while we found lots and lots of resistance genes, the things that we really cared about is, how can a study of this ilk inform public health policy, right? And what we argued was by, by publishing these methods and by showing you can use high resolution methods, we were able to identify two specific habitats, two specific points that we sampled in El Salvador and Peru that were hot spots for resistance exchange between humans and the environment. In El Salvador, it happened to be chicken coops. So the El Salvadorans in this case were raising chickens as subsistence animals. Very important to note is that they were not giving the, the animals any antibiotics, right? These are, these are antibiotic-free chickens that they're raising for themselves. And yet, when we looked at the fecal droppings of those chickens, they were enriched for resistance genes that we also found in the humans and in the soil. Suggesting that the chickens, because they also go in and out of those hutments, might be a vector for transmission for antibiotic resistance genes. And the reason I would argue that's even more important for us Americans, right, is because we largely consume poultry that has been bathed in antibiotics, right? Almost all the chicken that you can buy in this country has been subjected to antibiotics as growth promoters to make them a little bit cheaper, right? So imagine now for a second, right, this is the state of, of saying this is a hot spot for transmission without antibiotics happening. What do you think happens when you introduce antibiotics into that particular equation, right? Question? How do, you, how do antibiotics make animals grow better? I wish, I wish someone knew the answer to that question. So there's, there's, there's lots of hypotheses. It's kind of bizarre that we don't know. There are some ideas that, that they suppress particular microbes. Also keep in mind that those antibiotics that make those animals bigger, they're not used at therapeutic concentrations. So they're not used at the concentrations that you would use in the clinic. They use at much, much lower doses. So what those chemicals are doing to perturb the ecosystem at those low concentrations is still not very well known. They're absolutely a source of resistance as well. So the, one of the last resort antibiotics is colistin. It's a very important class of antibiotics. Uh, and uh, it was something that we were holding out for because there was not much resistance to it. And last year, we saw the first report of massive resistance to colistin on a plasmid, which means it can move around. And where do you think that colistin resistance was found? It was found on a pig farm in China, because China happens to be one of the few countries that allows colistin to be used in animal rearing. Okay, and as soon as that was found, we started searching around, and now that resistance gene has been found all over the place. It hasn't disseminated around the globe massively yet, but it's going to happen. Okay, so in Peru, uh, the hotspot happened to be uh, uh, the, the wastewater treatment plant. So wastewater treatment plants were designed in the era of domestication, of only looking at the few microbes that you want to detect. So they were designed with processes to get rid of the microbes that you can culture out of the human gut, E. coli and things like that. And they're very, very successful at doing that, right? So that's all you're assaying for. But we now use methods of a metagenomic. We're looking at the other microbes. So A, we did confirm that, the, that this wastewater treatment plant, which gets sewage from large, you know, thousands and thousands of people around Lima, worked exactly as designed. It got rid of all of the human microbes. But it actually got enriched for a higher diversity of environmental microbes that can withstand those conditions. So big deal, right? That's not a big problem. Well, unfortunately, we found that those microbes had now been enriched with resistance genes from the human microbes, okay? And the bigger part of this puzzle now, or a problem, is Lima is a desert. So they have scarcity in terms of their water supply. So this apparently clean water is used to irrigate every single park in Lima. Doesn't have any coliforms, doesn't have any bugs from the gut, but it has environmental microbes that have resistance genes that can cause problems in humans. There's your transmission network.
Okay, so now hopefully, or not hopefully, but perhaps at this point in the, uh, the, the talk, you're thinking, well, why am I alive, right? Uh, <laughs> how, how have these bugs not uh, wiped us out? And in fact, if you look at the CDC, they do put these nice pictures out there to, to really, you know, scare the bejesus out of us, right? All of these really nasty bugs killing all sorts of people around the U.S. and around the world. So are we, are we truly in a post-Andemarag era? Or do, we, do we get into our bubbles and not interact with anyone? Uh, no. Um, so this is the good part of the talk, right? It's short. Um, it has a little bit of jargon in it, and again, I'll try to distill things down. So there's a theory out there, comes from this field of systems biology, which says what we need to do, again, is think in ecological terms and come up with scenarios with, that invert selection, right? Selection in this case, everything I've been telling you about has been pretty simplistic, right? Here's selection occurring. Here are two different sets of microbes, right? In this case, the yellow one is the wild type, the susceptible microbe, the, the one that will be killed by the antibiotic. And blue is the one that's going to survive, the resistant one. Normal selection is you bring the antibiotic in, what's going to happen? It's going to kill the one that it's not resistant to. The blue one is going to take over, and now you have a resistant population. That's everything I've been telling you about so far. What if we could come up with some clever scheme, some chemical, some perturbation that switches things around? where at least for some transient period of time, I can introduce a different selection pressure, wipe out the resistant guys somehow, and then bring in the antibiotic and kill the susceptible guys, right? So, no, great, that sounds like magic, and for the most part it is, because we don't have a lot of that, but, uh, but a few theories have been put forth as to how can we get selection inversion. So one actually comes from agriculture, it's the idea of crop rotations, right? In this case, it's called drug cycling. Let's take two drugs that work differently, right? So very simplistically, what you can do is you've got this mixed population. You just have to find a drug that's going to wipe out the blue guys, right? So now, yes, the yellow ones will enrich, right? And now you bring in a different drug, drug that's going to wipe out the yellow guys. So now you've been able to wipe out that resistant population. And maybe they'll take over after a while, but you can keep cycling between those two drugs, wiping resistant one out after the other after the other. Now, the problem with that idea is it's only going to work for a short period of time. As soon as one bug gets resistant to two antibiotics, and I, could show, I showed you it could happen to four or five antibiotics, that's the end of your cycling. So people have, have talked about, well, why not cycle you know, 16 drugs? But after a while, you run under that too. It's still a clever idea for a period of time. Okay. The other is this idea called induced synergy. Okay. So what does induced synergy mean? Again, here's the very, very simple way that we would normally think selection works. You have a multi-drug resistant organism, right? So this organism happens to be resistant to A and B, which means if you hit it with A, nothing happens. Then you hit it with B, nothing happens. But there are these magical properties that drugs have sometimes, very specific, rare drugs, where now when you combine them, when you put them together, they're better than the trivial sum of their parts, right? So flour on its own is not terribly great. Uh, salt on its own is not terribly great. Yeast on its not, uh, own is not terribly great. You add all of that together, you add some sugar, and you have a yummy cake, right? It's better than the sum of its parts. Um, so I'm not talking about antibiotics as cake, even though they are used like that in some parts of the world. But here, somehow you can find this combination of antibiotics, which can then wipe out that population. So that exists. And the third one, the most important one, and the hardest one to easily grasp is this thing, because it's a complicated, unnecessarily complicated term. It's called collateral sensitivity. Yeah. So let's distill that down. What does collateral sensitivity mean? It is this rare property, and this is not talking about resistance as opposed to antibiotics. It says, for some classes of antibiotics, when a bug becomes resistant to antibiotic A, it becomes more sensitive to antibiotic B. And it's all about its resistance mechanism. Something, as it evolves to become resistant to that first drug, something that it does makes it more vulnerable to that second drug. Right? So let's take a very theoretical example. Imagine I had an antibiotic that, that targeted the ribosome. The ribosome is what makes proteins. Okay? So now I think I'm a really clever bug. I'm going to shut my ribosome down. I'm going to stop making those proteins for a while so that now drug A can no longer act. I'm resistant to drug A. Now, <clears throat> what if I bring in drug B that requires a lot of proteins to be made? I'm now susceptible, massively susceptible to that second drug. And that's the, the underlying concept of collateral sensitivity. So these are theoretical ways in which we might be able to repurpose old drugs. 
without, I mean, of course we need new drugs, but these are all ways in which to take drugs that already exist, cleverly use them together either by cycling them or by inducing synergy or by figuring out ways in which to have resistance work against each other. I'm gonna share one example of a way in which we've done that, okay? Um, and to do that, we went after one of these really bad, bad, bad bugs called methicillin resistant Staph aureus, right? So there are about 11 million infections of MRSA in the US and about 80,000 of them are really, really bad, they're bloodstream. And the reason they're really bad is right now, of those 80,000, about one in eight people will die. And they'll die because we don't have any drugs against them anymore. So what we decided to do was go after this to try to find a combination of antibiotics that had those features that could kill MRSA and prevent it from becoming more resistant, okay? And we decided to do something slightly crazy. We said, let's go to the class of drugs that defines antibiotic resistance. So methicillin is in the penicillin class. It's a beta-lactam. And we said, okay, you know, beta-lactams are not used against MRSA anymore. Haven't you been used for decades because they're resistant to them. Can we find clever combinations of those beta-lactams that can actually knock MRSA out? Let's, let's try to take its strength and convert its strength into its weakness, right? Uh, and so we tried to do that, and Pat Gonzalez, uh, also a recent uh, graduate in, in genetics, did exactly that. So he found a combination of three beta-lactam drugs. All of these drugs are generic drugs. They're just not used against MRSA because they're obsolete against MRSA. So first thing that Pat discovered is that they're synergistic. They are way better than the sum of their parts. So what I'm showing you here are the concentrations of the three compounds. You don't have to figure out all the details, but really what you want to take away is if they were additive, if they were just, you know, one drug was equal to itself, here's how much concentration you would require to kill it. When you put them together, here's how much concentration. Convert that into numbers, you require, you know, something like almost 60 to 100 times less drug to get the same killing effic efficacy, right? So a really, really potent combination. Importantly, a potent combination that is at concentrations that you can deploy into the blood based on our calculations so far. Okay, and then he also wanted to see potentially for, for uh, suppression of resistance, could he find collateral sensitivity? And that's exactly what Pat found. He found that he could not evolve this bug to be resistant to that combination. He tried really hard, right? He threw all sorts of concentrations because that's what you do. You try to break your drug to figure out what its susceptibilities are. And he couldn't do it. MRSA, no matter what we did, could not become resistant to this particular combination. Now, I'll, I'll put a word of caution out there. There is, I'll say this again, there is no such thing as an irresistible drug. There is no such thing as a, even a resistance-proof combination. What we've just shown is it's exceptionally difficult for MRSA to become resistant. So you can't stop here, but we think we've discovered something really cool because we've taken, and this is a little bit of mechanism, we, we know exactly what those drugs hit, and we've really figured out that we've, we've used its resistance mechanism against itself, right? As it becomes resistant to one component, it becomes weaker against the other component. We've shown how, and most importantly, we've been able to show in mice that this really works, right? So we used a very nasty model in mice, uh, it's called a neutropenic model. You go in into these poor mice, you wipe out its immune system, and then you give it a lot of MRSA. If you don't do anything after that, the mouse is dead in a day, its internal org organs liquefy, okay? Bad stuff. Um, and what we were able to show is that when we gave our triple combination, every one of the mice that we tried not only survived, there was no MRSA that we could find in the blood after a day, right? So we're very thrilled about this particular result. It's a silver lining and all of the bad stuff we usually discover. Uh, and we're kind of excited that because they're generic drugs, um, we're hopeful that we can bring this therapy to market pretty quickly, right? We've got estimates from FDA consultants that we of course need to do some more clinical trial work that we might be able to get this to market on the order of about four years, as opposed to a normal new entity drug, which takes seven, eight, 12 years to bring to market, right? Um, so with that, I'll end uh, the talk on a couple slides here. Uh, again, remember that this is the network that I showed you. Perhaps the most important part of this interaction network is one I haven't talked about, and that is the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture. I alluded to it, but I didn't tell you that 80% of antibiotics by weight in this country are used at subtherapeutic concentrations to make our meat cheaper. And I'm a huge fan of the agricultural industry. I love my meat. I would certainly say that this is a terrible, terrible use of this natural resource, right? And what I would advocate is if you go out there and you wanna think about what you can do is to consider how you might increase advocacy for research that could help the animal industry replace the antibiotics. Banning the antibiotics is gonna do nothing, right? This is gonna get people 
uh, in, uh, you know, really upset that you're going to take away their livelihoods. But there are cool ways that people are proposing of modulating the microbiome, understanding, as the gentleman asked earlier, why do the antibiotics work? And if we can understand why the antibiotics work, we can come up with different therapeutics, still get our cheaper meat, and save our antibiotics for us and our kids. Right? And with that, I'll thank you. Of course, I'll have to thank, again, all the people in the lab. Uh, we've had lots of great people come through, uh, uh, collaborators both externally around the world as well as at WashU. Uh, and then, of course, you know, science is not possible without funding. We've been very fortunate to get funding across a bunch of different resources. Uh, and then I'll take questions and leave you with this. <laughs>